Hey guys, during this video we're going to cover subtopic 3.2 on interactions between molecules. These are going to be our learning objectives, um, so we'll look at these in uh, some fine detail and we'll see how these link directly into the science understandings of the say subject outline. This is the first one that we need to consider and it's the idea that the physical properties of molecular substances can be explained by considering the nature and strength of forces of attraction between the molecules. In particular, we're going to focus on melting and boiling points. And to start us off, we're going to be looking at one group um, of molecules, uh, better what we would refer to as monatomic atoms. These are the noble gases, so starting off with helium and then neon and argon, krypton, xenon and radon. These are all in group 8. And what we can see is that there is this trend of increasing boiling point going from helium down to radon. One thing to note is that their boiling point is still relatively low, so this is all in the minus degrees Celsius range. Uh, in a similar case, we've got uh, another class of molecules. In this case, we've got diatomic molecules of group 7. Uh, so we've got fluorine, which exists as F2, chlorine as Cl2, bromine uh, as Br2, and so on and so on. And regardless of whether we look at melting and boiling points, we can see that there is this, again, increasing trend. So the boiling point and melting point increase as we go from fluorine to astatine. Secondary interactions between molecules are much weaker than primary metallic ion and covalent bonds. And we could observe that based on the um, boiling points and melting points of some of these substances. To just take us back, we, in 2.1, covered these ideas of intra- and intermolecular forces. The focus for this video is going to be looking at intermolecular forces, which are the forces of attraction between molecules. These are generally seen as weaker than any type of intramolecular bonding. To look at this, we've got a table of information about four substances, gold, sodium chloride, silicon dioxide, and benzoic acid. And I've summarized here the differences in the structure as well as the bonding of these materials. What we can see is that benzoic acid is the only molecular substance here. And because of that, the forces between its particles, between its molecules, is very weak. It's only consisting of intermolecular forces, whereas all of the other substances, the gold, sodium chloride, and silicon dioxide, all consist of strong inter intramolecular bonding between its particles. We can see, as a result, there is a great difference in the melting point of these latter structures versus this molecular structure here for benzoic acid. To reinforce this idea, we've got hydrogen chloride, and it's important to note that hydrogen chloride consists of a strong intramolecular force, that's a covalent bond, that holds the hydrogen and chlorine atoms together, but it's not this bond or this force that contributes to properties like the melting and boiling point. Uh, hydrogen chloride's boiling point is actually quite low, it's minus 85.05 degrees Celsius. And the reason why it's uh, quite low is because it only has weak intermolecular forces that help hold the molecules together. So that when we melt or boil these um, molecular substances, we're looking at disrupting these much, much weaker forces between the molecules. So I've just made an important note here, and it's worthwhile if you get this down, that intermolecular forces are what determine physical properties of covalent molecular substances, not the strong covalent bonding that holds the atoms in the molecule itself. This just helps summarize what I've just talked about. So looking at the fact that covalent molecular substances have low melting and boiling points, that's because of uh, the weak intermolecular forces that are holding them together, as opposed to the strong intramolecular forces that hold ionic, metallic, and covalent network substances together. As a result, less thermal energy is needed to separate molecules from one another, as opposed to atoms or ions from a lattice structure. The next science understanding uh, then gets us to look at how shape, polarity, and size of molecules can be used to explain and predict the nature and strength of secondary interactions. This is quite an important um, understanding and it's something that we will cover as we learn about the different types of intermolecular forces and see how they can be affected and how they affect physical properties. So these are the three main types of uh, intermolecular forces. We've got dispersion forces, 
dipole-dipole interactions and hydrogen bonding. The first one, dispersion forces, we say it exists between all molecules and their strength depends on two things, the size and the shape of the molecules. Dispersion forces are essentially the reason why certain molecules don't have extremely low melting and boiling points. I've said before that dispersion forces are present between all molecules, but it's the only force that we find between nonpolar molecules. Dispersion forces can result from a combination of two things. The first is looking at how nuclei in one molecule, which is positively charged, can attract electrons in neighbouring molecules. But the second point is probably the most important point because it helps explain how these forces generally form and it's through the formation of what we call temporary dipoles. We're going to look at this in the next slide. So just imagine we've got two atoms here. Let's just imagine that they're uh, neon atoms. We might think normally, because they're neutral and they're not polar, that they shouldn't be attracted or repelled by one another. But what can happen in a certain situation is that the electrons in one of our neon atoms can, due to the random movement of its electrons, um, situate itself more on one end compared to the other. This is what we call a temporary dipole. It's temporary because it doesn't um, stay permanent, and uh, it's a dipole because it consists of two poles, one pole which is partially negative, one that's partially positive. The partially negative end represents where you've got more of the electrons residing as opposed to this end here. And because of that, if you have a, an adjacent molecule uh, next to this temporary dipole, it's going to help induce a dipole in this other molecule. So it will adopt a very similar arrangement, but because the electrons are constantly moving in a random fashion, they're going to then revert back to that uh, roughly spherical shape where you've got an equal distribution of charge. This slide helps you understand that uh, these temporary dipoles don't just occur between atoms, um, but they can also occur between molecules. Uh, and in particular, it helps to look at molecules that aren't usually uh, charged or polar. So we've got hydrogen molecules here, A and B. And hydrogen molecule A, you can see, has formed a temporary dipole. Because the electrons are randomly moving, they're now residing more on this side, making this end of the molecule partially negative, and this end becomes partially positive. This will then induce a dipole in the neighbouring molecule, hydrogen B, H2B, and it adopts very much the same arrangement. However, its uh, partially negative end is going to be drawn towards the partially positive end of hydrogen molecule A. So this attraction, keep in mind, only takes place momentarily, and then the electrons, because they randomly move, they can revert back to this non-polarized or non-dipole state. If we consider the halogens again, so that's the group seven uh, elements, remember I said they exist as diatomic molecules? What we can see is that their size generally increases going from fluorine down to iodine in this case. What we can also see from this table is that the melting and boiling points seem to increase as you go from fluorine to iodine again. And this is due to a number of reasons. Firstly, what we know is that the mass of the molecules increases. If the mass of the molecules increases, so does the number of electrons. And if the molecule has more electrons, it has a greater ability to form dispersion forces because there's more electrons to essentially move around, there's a, a much easier chance that more electrons are drawn towards one end than the other, forming what we call a temporary dipole. So just think greater mass, greater electrons, greater ability to form dispersion forces. So this slide just helps summarize what I've mentioned with the, the halogens, but in a more general case, that size is one important factor that determines the strength of these dispersion forces. So the greater the size or the mass, the greater the number of electrons, therefore the greater the ability to form these temporary dipoles and induce dipoles, and then therefore the greater the strength of the dispersion forces. We can see evidence of this increase in dispersion forces as the mass increases by looking at one class of compounds. These are what we call the group 4 hydrides because it's uh, hydrogen-based compounds where 
The central atom is a group 4 atom, so carbon, silicon, germanium, and tin. And what we can see is that there is this general increase in their boiling points, and that will be due to essentially the increase in the size and the mass of these molecules. Shape is another factor that also influences the strength of the dispersion forces. Essentially, the greater the contact area between the molecules, the stronger the dispersion forces. So this represents three um, different molecules that all have exactly the same mass. However, in this case, n-pentane over to the right has the greatest contact area between its molecules, and as a result has the greatest boiling point out of the three. Neopentane over here, you can see has the smallest contact area, and therefore has the smallest boiling point out of the lot. This is going to influence the boiling point to a lesser degree compared to the mass. This just summarizes the information from the previous slide. So shape also influences the strength of dispersion forces, and it's all got to do with the contact area between the two molecules.